Now, John, there's a significant amount of explosive in the trash receptacle next to you. Try to run, and it goes up now. Uh, nobody's gonna run, but I got a hundred people out here. That's the point. Now, do I have your attention? As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks, every sack has seven cats. Every cat has seven kittens, kittens, cats, sacks, and wives. How many were going to St. Ives? My phone number is 555. No, 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 wait, I didn't get all that. Say it again. Not a chance. My phone number is 555 and the answer. Call me in 30 seconds or die. All right, seven guys with seven wives. Shut up, McLean, I'm good at this. Seven guys with seven wives. Shut the with up, McLean. He said seven wives with seven sacks. Seven, seven times wives? seven is 49. Now tell me the rest. Oh, your sack with seven sacks. Weren't you listening? Seven... Yeah, I was listening to here. What's wrong thing? with you? Well, I'm besides having a bad fing hangover for one all thing. All right, all right, all right. Seven wives times seven, 49 with seven cats. Seven times 49 is 343, right? What are you asking me or telling me? I'm telling you. 343 times seven is 24. 2,401 is what you got, right? Yeah, that's what I got. Is that it, 2401? Dial 555-2401. No, wait, wait, what? it's what? a trick. It's a trick. What do you mean? I forgot about the man. What man, f the man? We got 10 seconds. He said how many were going to St. Ives, right? The riddle begins as I was going to St. Ives. I met a man with seven wives. The guy and his wives aren't going anywhere. What are they doing? Sitting in the f***ing road, waiting on the moon. How the hell should I well, know? Who was going to St. Ives then? The guy, just the guy. Just one guy. The answer's one. Just one guy. How do you dial one? Five 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 zero 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 one. Zero zero one. Just one guy's going. Hello, John. Yeah, piece of cake. Give us something harder next time. But you're ten seconds late. No, no. The answer is one. Oh. There's a bomb in the trash. Oh. Go. Welcome to Franchise Killer, a podcast where we pick movie franchises or wannabe franchises, review them film by film, and see where things went wrong. All right. All right. We need a better Jeremy Irons, though. No, he does I, He, he does do. a terrible English accent in this, like kind of a hick accent. What do you... Oh, when he's actually... All, all right. All right. <laughs> Holy Toledo. Holy <laughs> Toledo. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm Reese. To my left is... David. Further off to my left... Irina. Across from me... Katya. Also known as... <laughs> Noah. And I don't think she ever talks... Yeah, well, a little bit. And oh. off in the uh, in the Big Apple there we have... AJ. And today we're talking about Die Hard with a Vengeance. I stand by that we should call it Die Hardest. Wait, is that the name of the movie or are That's we going to talk about it with a vengeance? <laughs> well, uh, I guess we'll find w- out. Die Hard with a Vengeance with a Vengeance. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It's a movie that came out in 1995. It's directed, again, by John McTiernan, who directed the first film in the franchise. He also directed Predator, The Hunt for Red October, Last Action Hero, and The 13th Warrior, among others. And I feel bad about this, but I never announced what he directed on the first Die Hard episode, so we didn't even get to talk about it. Uh, But I think it's pretty cool that he directed Predator... And the hunt for Red October. Those He's are two pretty big, mm-hmm. yeah, two pretty big ones. And th- apparently, he was supposed to do Batman Begins, but he turned it down to do this movie. Yeah, no, yeah, Batman Forever actually was it. Okay, yeah, Batman Forever. That would Man. be. Oh yeah, Batman Begins is way later. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Wait, Whoops. wait. Imagine how the DC universe may have unfolded if he had. I know. It, well, Batman Forever would have been a better movie. Yeah, I, I know like. exactly. Uh, it would have so we had at that point Batman, Batman uh, Returns, both directed by Tim Burton, mm. and then it went to Joel Schumacher, who kind of forever Batman Forever has his defenders because it's got Jim Carrey as Riddler and uh, oh, Tommy yeah. Lee Jones as Two Face, but it's that's the first sign of that franchise just going completely off the rails. Mm. And actually, that'd be a fun franchise to talk about. So mm. we should keep that one in our back pocket. But yeah, uh, John McTiernan directed Batman Forever would be pretty interesting i feel like I, I would like to see his take on a batman film but we got this instead and we'll see how we all feel about that yeah. indeed the movie we're talking about stars bruce willis samuel l jackson jeremy irons graham green colleen camp larry brigman uh, and sam phillips it is written by jonathan hensley who was not involved in the first two films in the uh, writing process i did also want to say this movie once again did the same thing that the first two films did in adapting a script that was meant for another film. 
Uh, the mo- it was intended for a film called Simon Says. Where'd they get that? Hmm. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, this was repurposed to be a Die Hard movie. It was also going to be used before this as a Lethal Weapon script. I I could can totally see, see it. Yeah, and that's the thing. But between the Lethal Weapon franchise and Die Hard, they've constantly been tied together in a weird way. Whether it mm-hmm. be through mm-hmm. scripts that they're tossing back and forth to use actors, I believe. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Bruce Willis and Mel Gibson were at one point gunning for each other's roles before the franchises even started. I could mm-hmm. be wrong. I Don't quote me on that. But I, these franchises I have been kind, of, yeah, they've been kind of intertwined throughout their uh, development. On this podcast, we first go over our thoughts on the film before revisiting it for the episode. Then we dive into the story, break it down bit by bit, and talk about the more significant moments. Then towards the end of the show, we give our brief reviews and numbered scores, along with an analysis on the health of the franchise and whether or not this film hurt it. Anyway, guys, had y'all seen this movie before the episode? AJ? No, I had not. I had not seen this one. Uh, Noah? Yes, indeed I had. You had? Yeah. Really? A long time ago. That's That's surprising to me. answer for most of them, though. I did, a long time like ago. you saw it a long time yeah, ago when I was you a wee lad. <laughs> well, well, because people always say, "Really?" Like you saw that, and I'm like, "Yeah, a long time ago." Okay, Irina, I haven't seen this one before. For some reason, I thought I had, but uh, upon watching it, I quickly realized none of this was familiar. Especially <laughs> when Samuel L. Jackson shows up, I you I would have remembered him being in this film, but I had no idea he was in this franchise. Yeah. The moment he shows up is, is, I feel like, the moment you know whether or not you've seen this movie. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, I have seen this. Or, no, I haven't seen this. Uh, David, how about you? That is a no from me, Bob. My name is not Bob, but sure. It's not? Richard? This is... Dick. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> These are real, real adrenaline shots in the episode. <laughs> Look, man, I'm bringing, I'm bringing in the David energy, the big D energy. He's bringing in the humor, yep. Uh, so, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, for me, I and I feel like I say this a lot about a lot of movies, just like Noah, but I've seen parts of this, or at least the beginning. This mm-hmm. is the one Die Hard movie, apart from the fifth one, which I am just scared to watch, uh, that I have not seen fully. So I've, I had seen Die Hard 1, Die Hard 2, and Live Free or Die Hard, and then I started this one at one point. Didn't get all the way through. I don't know why. These things just happen. Uh, so yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat with some of y'all here, except I I have at least a bit of uh, a bit of a recollection of seeing bits and pieces of this. Are y'all ready to get into the story, guys? Yes. Yes, sir. In the hands of a mastermind of terror. I want to play a game with Lieutenant McLean. What kind of game? Simon says. <laughs> The path to revenge leads straight to John McLean. If we don't do what this guy says, he's going to blow up another public place. Why me? What has he got to do with me? I have no idea. He just said it had to be you. It's nice to be needed. Simon says, get to the paper in Wall Street Station by 1020, or the number three train and its passengers vaporize. I'm not jumping through hoops for some psycho. That's a white man with white problems. You deal with Where the hell are you going, McLean? I know what I'm doing. Not even God knows what you're doing. This guy wants to pound on you till you crumble. Are you aiming for these people? No. Well, maybe that mime. He wants you to dance to his tune and then kill you. Oh, dear. You don't like me because I'm white. I don't like you because you're going to get me killed. Ah! On May 19th, this is a bad idea. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a New York police officer. I'm going to ask you to calmly and quietly start moving towards the other end of the car. When the theater goes dark. Trust me, guys. Duck. The roof blows off. In New York City, the Bonwit Teller Department store is destroyed by a bomb during the morning commute. The New York City Police Department gets a call from Simon claiming responsibility. Simon threatens to detonate another bomb unless suspended police officer John McLean is dropped in Harlem, wearing a sandwich board with I hate the N-word printed on it. 
<laughs> the NYPD complies, and a hungover McLean is picked up from his apartment. The sight of McLean wearing the board attracts the attention of Zeus Carver, an electrician who owns a nearby shop. McLean informs Carver that he is a police officer on a case, but he is soon attacked by a group of black men. The two manage to escape and retreat in a taxi. They arrive at NYPD's headquarters, where they learn that a large quantity of binary liquid explosives, which caused the Bonwood explosion, were recently stolen. Simon calls again and demands that both McLean and Carver follow his continuing instructions. All right. So I, I actually really like the opening to this movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You've got the music playing. It's a sunrise, and it seems like a normal day, and out of nowhere, music cuts, explosion in the streets, chaos ensues. Yeah. Uh, it I'd, felt very real, kind of, oh, cool, we're dealing with a bombing this time. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I also thought that this was a really natural follow-up to, well, the first one, mm-hmm. uh, not only in plot, but also the fact that it's actually on his own turf this time, and he's not at some weird location where some random event happens. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. finally a New York police officer, yeah. working or detective, working in New York. Exactly. Uh, even though he's kind of on suspension. Yeah. Uh, so after that, we catch up with John McClane, who is basically on a bender, and things are not going so well for him. He's, as I mentioned, suspended. I do like that we're, this, we're it seems like we're back down to the everyman John McClane, at least a little bit. I don't mm-hmm. think it's on the level that it was in the first film, but they do dial back uh, his, you know, action hero-ness the the perfectness of his character that he was yeah. in the second one where the it, invincibility it, yeah yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't feel like he has you know bulletproof vest on in this one quite as much right mm. i don't know if y'all feel the same way i think it it makes sense the scenario that they built up because um you know it, he <laughs> he's having trouble at home uh with his relationship he's got a bad hangover sort of almost this I have nothing to lose attitude. And so just kind of throws himself at situations mm-hmm. at this moment because he has to. So yeah. it, it, I can make the leap there yeah. just like he does several times. Yeah. And John McTiernan starts to take away things that were, you know, indicative of his first film and also insert things that were absent from the second one that I feel like make for a more effective uh, combination of ingredients than we had in Die Hard 2, even though I still like Die Hard 2 a lot. Well, this movie acts almost as if the second one didn't exist. Yeah. Which I like. Yeah. Uh, so Im- immediately, oh, not immediately, but we, our villain, Simon, we have this this back and forth between the two of them, mm-hmm. just like we had with Hans Gruber uh, over the the walkies. Yeah. It's... Now the villain and the hero are tied directly, whereas the other one, they didn't really know who they were. Each of the other ones were, yeah. and there was no like correspondence between the two in the second yeah. one. And Simon in this one, he has the charisma that was lacking from the villain in the second one, I, I feel oh, like as yeah. well. He's more interesting. Seems more conniving, and mm-hmm. like he has... He has a sophistication to him, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, But yeah, and what this movie takes away is this doesn't feel like, oh, die hard at an airport, die hard in a tower, die hard on a bus. It feels like... It's like a Dr. Seuss book. (laughs) Die hard in a plane. No, it it, it still, you know, the DNA still feels die hard, but it's, it, it just, it it feels different. It doesn't feel like it's recycling that same idea. Well, it does feel like it's recycling a little bit as far as the movie is following a very similar trajectory as the first. You have two people, which we will learn. I don't know if you want to save it for later, but both are Grubers. Yeah. Both are... (laughs) What a bunch of Grubers. (laughs) (laughs) And and it's all just like this weird trajectory to try to make more money and get away and make it look like a terrorist act when it's actually not. He's having wife issues again. Yeah. Uh, And there's uh, the communication over the phone. So there's a lot of like parallels. It's just not in Nakatomi Tower. Yeah. uh, But the the way this movie is laid out is... The, at least the the way it's set up, John McClane is just barely squeaking by, m- meeting this guy's demands. Like it's less of a tit for tat like in the first Die Hard. It's more of like, oh, we we have to meet. He's constantly, 
mm-hmm. you know, he knows exactly where we are. We're in, mm-hmm. Whereas in the first Die Hard, it was like, oh, we don't know where John McClane is. We, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, no, they know exactly where he is. He's completely exposed. And that's the difference, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Do you all have any other thoughts on the opening to this movie? I mean, we need to talk about uh, Samuel L. Jackson. As yeah, that's, I was, exa- was going to go right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we don't have his wife in this one, but we've got a budding bromance. Yep. I uh, Samuel Jackson, I feel like, really injects life into this movie mm-hmm. that distinguishes it from the previous ones as well. Yeah. It does make you realize, or at least me, anyway, that Die Hard 2 is the inferior sequel, mm-hmm. not Die Hard with a Vengeance. I feel like Die Hard with a Vengeance actually makes some ground back up. Right. Do any of y'all disagree? I'm trying to test the room here to see what people's feelings are with this movie opening up. I think um, I, I'm i on board so far. I think it isn't until later that I I don't feel like the chemistry between Sam Jackson and Bruce Willis is as great as other pair-ups I've seen. It's It felt like a exactly like Lethal Weapon to mm. me, but just not the same sort of back and forth and actual understanding of one another. And that's mostly because they have to jump around to each scenario. I, I enjoyed mm-hmm. it, but I think for me personally, I like to see a little more leveling with one another, mm. you know, where they start to bond, I suppose. Yeah. Well, there is a form of realism in this, I feel, where mm-hmm. if this actually happened, and especially the way they met, I could see Samuel L. Jackson's character being a lot more hesitant you know, in, in this kind of scenario, being yeah. forced to join them on this uh, cat and mouse. But he seems mouse. to kind of enjoy it sometimes. He, he, he learned to enjoy it. Yeah. He, I just, I do like how frustrated he gets. I think uh, Samuel L. Jackson said that um, Zeus is the character it closest to his actual personality out mm-hmm. of all the roles he's ever played. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it comes through. I mean, this is like prime time. Prime time what? Samuel Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, was, I got stuck between Zeus and Samuel L. Jackson, and yeah, <laughs> this is prime time. I, I actually by like. Amazon. <laughs> I I actually think there's enough of a you know, not quite a bromance, but a, a buddiness yeah. to it that you feel like this is yeah. this is how the buddy relationship got started, and in the sequel, it would like progress more. Right. You're right, though. They're they're more often at odds with one another and not making up much ground until mm-hmm. the end where, you know, uh, Zeus really steps up to the plate yeah. and gets a lot done. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that. I just think it was more once you see these two characters, you think, oh, yeah, I'm so excited. And you do get a little bit of that payoff as far as, you know, the quips at one another and things like that. But uh, it just wasn't quite what I was expecting it to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really I actually thought uh, Samuel L. Jackson was hilarious in this. Oh, no, I like uh, Especially with his, yeah. like, the confusion over his name, Hey Zeus. <laughs> he's like, no, hey, comma, Zeus. My name is Zeus. You know, Zeus, god of thunder. Uh, god of thunder. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually really like that. Lightning bolt up your ass. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and there's a the whole bit around the, the phone booth where he's he makes McLean say that he needs him more than... The other way around. Right. Um, I I liked it. I liked it. Simon sends the two on a series of riddles, which ultimately leads them to reach the Wall Street subway station within 30 minutes to stop a bomb planted on a Brooklyn-bound three train. McLean boards the subway while Carver drives to the stop. Though Carver answers Simon's call and McLean locates the bomb, it detonates immediately after McLean throws it off the train, derailing the train and damaging the subway station. As McLean and Carver regroup with the police, they meet FBI agents Bill Jarvis and Andy Cross, who reveal Simon has been identified as Peter Krieg, a former colonel in the East German People's Army, and a mercenary for hire. However, Krieg's real name is actually Simon Peter Gruber, dun dun dun, <laughs> the brother of Hans Gruber, whom McLean had killed years earlier in Los Angeles. Okay, so um, I think this is a... Uh I do enjoy this film and I I like where it's going, but it is, um, you can tell it feels very rushed and that's probably because they were taking the idea from a book. Honestly, I would love to read this book. It it sounds kind of up my alley because I love that thriller puzzles, you know, got to get here in time Mm -hmm. before people are killed kind of a thing. But um, I think they had to 
pack that together. So a lot of the time, uh, <laughs> McLean and Zeus are just sort of yelling instructions at each other before I can even understand what the riddle was or, yeah. you know, what the situation is. So I end up pausing, trying to think, like, oh, okay, what happened? Wait, I, I didn't get the payoff of them figuring it out, really. Mm. Action so, movie stuff. I, yeah, and, and there's no problem with that. I still enjoy it. I think it's fun. But I, I kind of like being able to hang there sort of in the puzzle for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, well, Simon didn't give them a lot of time to hang there in the I puzzle. I know, I know. <laughs> in fact, like I think that's the whole point. Simon's trying to make it just impossible for them right but they're just managing to keep up and it's revealed later that he's making yeah. it impossible just to distract them from what he's really doing i got that same feeling i would get as a kid when they would do those group activities where it was problem solving and there were always those stupid two kids that for some reason could get the answer in like two seconds and you're just trailing along running after yeah. the next clue and you didn't even get to participate like, shut up <laughs> I, it honestly <laughs> did feel kind of like a the way that a villain in a kid's movie would act too. Like this weird way of getting back at the, the main character. I'm just going to string them along with these unsolvable riddles, so which are actually solvable. That's like the, he's just, what? That's the thing I actually kind of liked about this though, is that it, um, conceptually it seems petty, but really it wasn't. He was just kind of a perfect part of the plan. Yeah. And so it's it's meant to be like, oh, yeah, I'm antagonizing this guy and, you know, trying to make his life hell. But really, I have a different motive. I, mm. I liked that. I thought that was clever. Just, they could have killed him, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, that's it. Like, that would have solved. Yeah, but it. then the police wouldn't be chasing after these uh, red herrings, basically. Yeah. I, I would have loved to see. Actually, no, it would be a worse movie. But it would be funny to see McLean having not run into... Samuel Jackson or Zeus, mm -hmm. would have, what would have happened if it was just him alone trying to solve these things? It would have been <laughs> literally impossible. Like, because that's just like not his wheelhouse. It's, <laughs> so it's kind of the perfect setup between yeah. the t uh, pairing the two of them. Right. Uh, yeah. But like, an extra what, brain. This to movie would have been much shorter without Zeus. He would have just gotten killed by the mob at the beginning. Yep. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, which I guess is what Simon wanted, but I feel like it's also not what he wanted because he kind of wanted. McLean to suffer a little bit first. Yeah. yeah. I wonder what was going to happen if he actually just died there. I guess that could have been a part of the plan. It's like, oh, well, he either was going to live or he was going to die. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah so, I, yeah, I was going to say it's probably, <laughs> it's probably something like that. Or he was like, no, this person, I like he's done his research. So he knows, okay, this guy will probably find a way out considering his history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just make things really difficult. I heard him. this guy killed a guy with an icicle. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hate all of you. <laughs> no, I, I had to think for a second. That was actually, I just remembered the second movie. I don't know why. It yeah, because this movie doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> no, I still like the second I movie. Do it's just a, it's just yeah, a different too. animal. Yeah, I know definitely it, better. It doesn't, AJ it doesn't like actually well, feel like it's in the same universe. It's kind of strange, though. You know, and I will say this one get goes a little off the rails towards the end as mm -hmm. well, too. Yeah. Like it gets a little ridiculous. You just can't recapture that yeah. original Die Hard yeah. ever completely in, I, in the sequel. So, as someone else who also enjoys puzzles and riddles and things, what did you think about this, AJ? The biggest thing was the repartee between Zeus and McLean. Like, I thought their dynamic was, was really good because Zeus has his own strong personality. And so, it, like you said, it kind of carries the movie along and it gives it that energy. Mm -hmm. And it also, like, I don't know if it was, you know, the framing of shots, cinematography, like, the tone definitely felt like a return to form from the first. Like, right. even if I didn't look up the director, I probably could have, you know, told that this was the same director as the first, it, it really felt like tonally a return to form at least. Yeah. So, um, totally. it's the, the setting is different, you know, the environment, they're not within a building. Like you said, they're, you know, spread out going everywhere across the city, but like it still felt a little bit more diehardish to me and, and like everything is kind of a bit more memorable sticking right. out in my brain. So like you were talking about the puzzles, like it's, it's silly and it's like the riddles are just kind of, goofy but they <laughs> kind of just still get you involved in, in what's going on and impelling you forward yeah um, with you know the two that are still bouncing off each other as well yeah so another sense thing of energy i guess that kind of uh is 
different. Like the the second movie had energy with the action, but this is still action with you know the energy just feels a little bit different. I don't know how to put words to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean though, because the the second one had energy, but it was almost this. It, it was kind of cacophonous in its energy, right. where you just don't really remember any signature moments, just that there was a lot of it. But in yeah. this movie, like you said, there are moments that stand out to you. It's more memorable. I also think it's because it, this one is a little more grounded in reality. Like, yeah. I think all of the acts of terror in this movie are much more uh, well, not, I don't want to say well staged because Die Hard had some spectacular sequences, but they never rung as, like, realistic to me. The ones in this one, the explosion at the beginning, the train going off the rails. I've said off the rails a million times in this episode, but going off and, you know. It, bl- it blends the action with still, like, McLean and Zeus both have to use their wits. Right. Instead of just, you know, shooting guns and explosions and all this stuff. And, like, he's, like, following an ambulance. He calls in an ambulance to, to you know, basically break the crowd or blaze a trail for him through traffic. He goes through the park. And both of them have their own strengths in tackling these puzzles while simultaneously having that action aspect of it. Right. So it's kind of multidimensional instead of just explosions and bullets. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't have, like, 50 bullets in one clip in this one. Yeah. I, th- I think this one overall was just a lot more put together, and it was very streamlined. It knew where it was going from the beginning, mm-hmm. whereas the second one seemed to dawdle in certain areas and think, oh, yeah, this would be a cool thing, and then, oh, yeah, that also would be cool. Yeah. But uh, I think what it boils down to is that this is just in a separate tier from... Uh, the second one. The second one's still good, but it's you know. A good you don't know. This yeah. is a new there are some tier. people who might think that the second one is better. It Fair is. Enough. It is neat to frame this. You know, where McLean is now in a new context, where he's mostly collaborating with other people, like yeah. Cobb, um, his boss, like all those characters around him, surrounding him, supporting him, right. are more interesting, and he's you know directly interacting with them instead of across you know from a walkie-talkie or right. phone or whatnot like yeah we still see john mcclain as an individual you know despite his surroundings and despite his supporting cast yeah and it's it's kind of refreshing to see that there's a new spin on this um, both environmentally and contextually with his you know su- supporting cast but yeah. it still yeah. works as you know an overall like you like we said yeah. you kind of bring that character back the human aspect of the realistic aspect of his character as well yeah because yeah. the the first two Everyone was against him. It wasn't, it felt like the, the law enforcement was against him and the terrorists or burglars, whatever you want to call them, were right. against him as well. It was, so it was like clipping him at both ends. This one's like finally a collaborative thing where people are on his side. They're actually like, hey, what do we do, John McClane? Yeah, I really yeah. and I were talking about that because this is the first time the police chief was actually working right. with him. Well, <laughs> it's like, okay, if you want that, we'll help out. Well, also the, the thing that tends to happen with uh, police chiefs or inspectors or, you know, whoever's in charge there is they go one of two directions. It's always the, uh, I'm a I'm a hard ass shtick and, oh, you can't do that without, you know, I am the authority here. And then the other end is that they're just a com- they don't know what they're, they're doing. They're like, yeah. oh, what do we do? I don't know what to do in this mm-hmm. situation. Like, how did you get that job then? Because you are you you make yeah, no executive decisions at all. <laughs> but this guy yeah. is right in the middle. I actually really love this. I think he's an inspector. But um, I agree, yeah. Larry the, Brickman did a great uh, job. And gosh, what's his name? I know his name. A, uh, was it Carver? Or yeah, I think Carver's Carver. Carver. Right. So um, I actually really enjoy this character, even though he's not a strong lead in this film. It's it's mm-hmm. still enjoyable to watch someone that is portraying a job accurately yeah. instead of just being a stereotype from the films. I agree. Another thing this movie does better than the second one is having a a reason to exist that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the second one, it was just like, oh, the, this is the same plot as the first one, but in a different area. Right. Uh, and how could this happen to the same character twice right and it's yeah. like this doesn't make sense like john McClane's one of us uh you don't run into these situations more than mm. once in your life as i mentioned in the last episode especially right. since he's just a cop yeah right. i mean what's happening in this one though no with this one with there the revelation that it simon gruber is involved in this 
directly oh, ties it okay. back to... I see what to, you mean. There's a reason for him yeah. actually going to... Yeah, it's, it's in this case, it's the villain is seeking out McLean, not McLean just running out into yeah. some random situation. What are you doing here? Yeah, so it actually makes sense that this would happen. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's Die Hard with a vengeance, mm-hmm. remember? Whose vengeance? Simon says it's his vengeance. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, what did y'all think about the revelation that... Simon Gruber was behind this. The brother, older brother of Hans Gruber. (laughs) Lift the sunglasses off. Oh my God. And I think at this point, we haven't yet seen him, but it's still his voice. It's almost immediately after that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Which it's Jeremy Irons, which I Uh, think has one of the sexiest voices out there. Except when when he's trying to sound American. (laughs) Holy (laughs) Holy Toledo. Holy Toledo. (laughs) I think, honestly, I would would put his American accent on the same page as... uh, Laura Croft Tomb so, Raider with uh, Laura. The nice Daniel thing, Craig. though, yeah, there you go. is that um, at least he's not supposed to be playing an American in this movie. So I could believe that he's German and he's just really bad at American accents. Yeah, they were probably like, okay, so I want you to do a German accent and then do an accent on top of that, an American one, but make it sound like you were German. <laughs> Yeah, make it sound like you're <laughs> kind of uncomfortable impressive. in that accent. Yeah, because his German so accent is really good. I that at least makes sense if you really want to think about it. Yeah, so. and it, it goes in line with uh, Gruber in the first one. You know, still having grammatical errors, even though right. he's an intelligent person. But English is not his first language, so yeah. the way his syntax is is obviously a foreigner in some right. instances. And so this kind of goes in line with that. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it's kind of cool to think about. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's at least something where you can wave it away with that explanation and not sweat about it. Mm-hmm. So as their attitudes go, I'll say Simon seems more like a serial killer while Hans was more of a con man. It, it, as far as their attitude towards people and the way they acted to others. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I suppose. I'm I, not saying like... I just think serial killer might not be the right... Well, well, no. <laughs> well, the reason I think the what you're getting at is the scope of their ambition. Right. Uh, yeah. Hans was kind of more focused, you know, microscopically and had contingencies for everything. Where Simon here is, you know, big picture, kind of more grandiose. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Both underlying similar motivation, but the the scope of what they're doing is on different yeah. right uh, perspectives. Well, yeah. And even like Simon says, yeah, like. Hans, my brother's an asshole, but doesn't mean I'm not going to respond to, you know, him dying. So they obviously kind of butted heads in what their approach was. And, you know, that's probably why they didn't cooperate (laughs) or collaborate on other crimes, you know, kind of retconning things a little bit. But, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think it's just uh, one of the, the, my difference is that when Hans Gruber falls, I feel a twinge of regret. You know, mm-hmm. but uh, with this guy and his death, I don't really feel anything at all because it, I think the way it's shot, you don't actually really get to know him other than I like to play games and I want the money, but I'm going to pretend it's a statement and, you know, throw it in the ocean or whatever. Yeah. I, I don't really feel much else other than, yeah, this guy's a villain. Uh, he yeah, he also just finished, you know, double crossing his own team, so exactly. that doesn't help. Yeah. I feel feel sorry for their parents. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless their parents caused oh, we have be this way. two terrorist kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe they don't have parents. What are the chances? Anyway, I'm sorry. Where are we in the story right now? Yeah, we should we should move on. Simon calls the police, knowing the FBI is there, to inform them that he has placed a bomb in an NYC public school that is rigged with a radio detonator triggered by the use of the FBI and police bands. Simon tells them that he will give McLean and Carver the school's location if they continue to play his games, but threatens that evacuating any school will lead to the device detonating. While McLean and Carver set off on Simon's next task, the police organize all of NYC's public works to search schools, using 911 to coordinate activities. As McLean and Carver solve Simon's riddles, McLean realizes that Simon is using the school bomb as a distraction to draw the police away from the bomb damage at Wall Street. They return there to find that Simon and his team used fake repair crews to dig into the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and steal $140 billion of gold bullion in dump trucks. They follow the trucks to an aqueduct in the New York City water tunnel number 3. McLean has Carver continue Simon's game while he follows the trucks. So, uh, at this point, do we have... 
Yes, the jugs. yes, no, we have the jugs. We have the jugs. All right, Reese, I wanted to know if you uh, figured out that riddle. I, I, When someone's going to give me the answer in two seconds... <laughs> they didn't give I, us the answer. Well, I thought they were. I was not I was not really paying attention to what was being said. I just heard another riddle, yeah. and I was like, okay, they're going to... I, 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 was, I, was, I wasn't either, but... Uh, we spent way too long on this. I think I, Irina started this by trying to figure it out, and uh, we each separately figured out how... It would work, but uh, did, the whole uh, did you want to explain the rules and then we can explain the situation? I like, oh, this. Yeah. I like this idea. So um, basically the situation is you have a bomb and the only way to uh, defuse it is um, by placing exactly the weight of four gallons uh, on the scale. So you're given two jugs. One of them can contain three gallons. The other one has the capacity of five gallons. And then you have a fountain to fill each gallon to whatever capacity you want. So with the unlimited water supply, using just those two jugs, how would you get exactly four gallons on that scale? And you can't eyeball it. You can't do yeah, anything it has like to be that. It has perfect. to be exact. I don't know. Let's find this out real time. Do you, do you want the answer? Do you, we do. Do you want to try and figure it out, Reese? Not real not right time, now. Reese. All right. So wait, the first one's four gallon jug. The second one's a five gallon jug. No, no one three is a five gallon. gallon. Three gallon. There's three gallon and a five gallon. And a five gallon. But you need and four a stream gallons. of water. Yeah. And you need four. Three gallon, five gallon. Can you solve it as fast as Bruce Willis did? Well, he didn't solve it. The other guy did. Kind of. No, I don't know. Well, they, both, just well, they both did. They both got it. All right. So for the sake of speeding things along, the the way to do this is that first fill up the... Uh, three gallon? Yeah, the three gallon. You pour it into the five gallon. So there's like two left Leftover. over. Yep. Then you do... The three you gallon fill again. the three gallon again. And oh my gosh, I'm breaking my brain. Okay, right here now, here we go. I'm using it again. <laughs> here, let me, let's but. say it this way. So you fill up the three gallon, add it to the five, and then you fill up the three gallon again and add it to the five. But then you're left with one gallon in the three gallon container. So with that one gallon, you pour out the five that are in the five gallon, pour the one into the five, fill up the three again, pour it into the five, and you have exactly four. There's a second way to do it, though, mm -hmm. and that's filling up the five gallon, pouring it into the three, and then you have two left over in the five. You do that again. And then you pour out the three, and then you fill up the three, and you can pour it back in, right? Wait, no, wait. I, I, mixed, I, think I mixed, mixed it up. up. See, I it mixed happens. it up. It's yeah. terrible. No, but there is there's another way but there, to do there's, it. Let's not, let's Solve not it at home with your I don't with your want to waste friends. time with it, but... But it's yeah, fun. It's, it's like I'm glad, I'm glad y'all sol it, solved it. It is fun to just kind of you know on the way over here uh, puzzle over it. And That's funny. Puzzle over it. it exactly. I like I'm puzzles. glad you figured it out. Figured I was just kind of yeah. like just let it go completely in one ear and out the other, <laughs> as I do when I watch but, action movies. <laughs> yeah, if anyone was confused about that, there's your answer. Don't give me any confusing riddles in this action movie. I'm here to watch explosions. That's I like the riddles. No, that's good. I'm glad y'all got more out of it than I did. <laughs> Uh, but you know this uh, elevator scene when he's noticing the lottery uh, numbers and the what badges. You're say. You know exactly what yep. I'm oh, saying. Oh yeah. yeah, I think what, we all. What, yes. what movie stole this? Captain America. Winter well, not Soldier. Captain America, but Winter Soldier. It was. Yeah, it was Winter Soldier. Yeah, but that's the second one. I said yeah. Captain America. It could have yeah. been either. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but that that scene was totally taken. Right? It was. It was totally influenced. Exactly. It. Even the yeah. way that he observed them doing yep. that, and uh, then they're all, like, holding him down to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah I, this I, one was a little more violent, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's actually another movie reference that I picked up on that I don't, I don't know if this was really intentional, but it was so close that I just can't believe it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that's the scene where um, Zeus is about to answer the phone, and that cop in the subway stops him. But the cop is like, you know, wide eyed and a little shaky, like with his gun yeah. pointing at him. It reminded me exactly of the scene with Frozone in Incredibles. Oh, yeah, that's right. When yeah. he's in that uh, jewelry store, he's like, I just want a drink. And the guy's yeah. like, freeze. And You're he's right. shaking exactly, everything. That's exactly the scene. And they're both Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Ooh, that's so it has to, it has to be. <laughs> like, there's no way. Wow, that's, that's a, gotta be a reference. Yeah. Heard here first, people. There's a connection <laughs> between Die Hard 3 and The Incredibles. 
Uh, Im- important stuff. So I'll say this movie loses a bit of, of its momentum during this segment. I, I still think it's engaging. Uh, but I was just like, this is kind of middle portion of the movie, and I'm just, there's no big propulsive action sequence that I'm, you know, that's keeping me going. But yeah. it's still interesting because you're kind of unraveling the puzzle. Mm-hmm. What What is Simon actually doing? Mm-hmm. Uh, is he is this just about McLean or is this is he actually trying to get all this money? Like what what's happening here? Mm. Or is it both? Which it ends up being yeah. both. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I would love? I would love to watch a YouTube channel where some sort of fitness trainer talks about how many calories these action heroes burn in the day that they're doing all of this stuff. Yeah, probably a lot. I'd love to see that. And they're not eating any food <laughs> I know. in any of these scenes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty sure they do like workout regimens before their the uh actual shooting as well. Exactly. Like I, I think I know that is at least today they do, especially for superhero movies where you right. have to have rippled muscles. Uh McLean though, you know he's in good shape too, so who knows? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I like the uh, aspect of this film that feels like, you know, they're just kind of using New York City as their jungle gym. Mm-hmm. It's it's fun just seeing them thrown into a whole bunch of scenarios. It's playful. Yeah. Uh, so where is everyone at in this like portion of the movie? How are y'all feeling? Is, is Are you still engaged? Uh, I've never I've... lost interest yet. Yeah, that's the same for you me. You haven't lost interest I, yet? No, I didn't lose interest. Although this movie never quite grabbed me the way the first two did at this point. Yeah. And I'm I've, just going to say the only reason is because the second one had bombastic craziness that was like, mm-hmm. all right, this, yeah. it's got me. But this one didn't quite have bombastic. It also didn't quite have the charm of the first one. So it's somewhere kind of in the middle for me as far as energy. Yeah. Oh, but it adds like two I, yeah. big players into the mix. I, like you got Jeremy Irons, Samuel Jackson. Yeah. That was new dynamic that's like wasn't there in the second yeah. one. And that's, that was me too. I love both of their characters. Like all the other... Uh, characters in the second one were completely irrelevant they didn't add anything in fact they almost detracted mm-hmm. i mean there i had no inherent problems with it but then yeah. this one has two just very charismatic yeah. additions to the already charismatic bruce willis yeah and i think the villain here is is more interesting because you don't quite know what he's getting at yeah. he yeah. says what he's getting at he's, he he kind of mentions his intentions and what he's doing but you're like, okay, what what is the actual end game yeah. here? You don't ever quite know. Whereas in Die Hard 2, it's revealed pretty quickly that oh, they're just trying to extract this yeah. general. And he's he's playing with his food the whole time, too. Yeah. Because he's pretty much got them outsmarted from the beginning. And I don't know, we haven't really got there yet, but he he does win, essentially. And I mean, it's overturned somehow, but yeah. you know. I will say, like, it's a bit... One thing this movie does that I didn't like as much is it, some of the clues that uh, McLean and Zeus are given to figure out, you, it would take a just pretty much a prodigy genius to figure out, like, where they need to be next. And I don't know if I quite believed, mm. you know, them... Like, the part later on where they find the ten coins in the pocket, and they're like, oh, we're... we're, we're ten, what, ten coins? Oh, that must mean that they're, they're at this bridge. That that was just a bit of a stretch for me, and there's a couple of instances in this movie where it's like, wow, that, that was a long shot, but you you were right. So I'm not entirely sure about this, but there is a good chance that the amount of knowledge they have of their field would lead to that the answers that they have being the more likely situation for them. So like, a lot of the stuff is based on instinct and the information given. So they're probably thinking, okay, like of all the options I have, this is you know, got to be the best one and just doing that. I didn't really have an issue with the whole feasibility of it, especially seeing as this is Die Hard and none of them really have yeah. a full-on realistic take. But, Except the first one. Well, the, even the first one had its things that are like, all right, well, you know, but it's like you forgive it because it's yeah. an amazing movie. But uh, another moment that I'm talking about is how did... And maybe I'm just missing something here, but it's how did McLean find out that all of these riddles were just a distraction from what Simon was actually doing? It was that kid, the the one that's like, oh, all the cops are gone doing something else. It's easy to rob stuff. You could rob, you know, But that whatever. seems like such a hunch to 
to stake this whole thing on that it's like yeah that's how a lot of cases are solved though through hunches but it's like he, he I, I don't think there's a lot of room for error because they yeah. know that simon has his eyes on him literally at all times he's known everything that he's doing yeah and to ha- it seems like a pretty bold move to you know split up and be like oh yeah. i've got i've got to act on this i know I'm, what you mean and i think it it was kind of thrown in there to try and you know turn his attention back on what might actually be happening but i think if there was something added to that for instance like a I think the only thing I could explain that away with is that he's familiar with the brother Mm -hmm. and how Hans Gruber had everything planned and mapped out to look like something that it's not and just to rob. So he probably could make that connection where, oh, what if this is another like Gruber ruse where Mm -hmm. they're sending me on this goose chase or thinking it's something else, but it's really he's just robbing, you know? Yeah. Gruber yeah. ruse, I like that. Your and, Gruber uh, ruse. <laughs> I think you forget how intelligent McLean is from the first one, just with his kind of knowledge of how people act. Yeah, he he is a good. Things. You're you're right. He's a good observer of people, and mm-hmm. that's one of his his skills. Boil yeah. it down to cops' instinct. Mm, yeah, I but, don't think he's like super book smart, but he's, no, he's definitely not. like. Yeah, he's very observant of. Yeah, he's right. he's street smart. Street Mart. <laughs> Street it's, Mart. Like, yeah. it's like it's like Kmart. God, yeah, it's Malcolm. the classic uh, development of a villain, though, and it, it it it's good development of villain versus uh, the protagonist or the hero, where you know the villain's hubris, especially an intellectual villain, like his yeah. overestimation of his yeah. own yeah. intellect and cunning and and scheming, and the underestimation of the hero. I mean, that's that's kind of the classic trope, but it's right. Um, you know, it's tried and it, true. It makes it works. for good storytelling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I I honestly didn't even really think that he was uh, making light of McLean or underestimating him. I I thought it, or at least in my perception, I figured he made this whole plan knowing that McLean was capable, but he just thought that he had it perfect already. <laughs> Yeah. Well, he kind of so, writes him off. Like, he sends him on this wild goose chase, and he, then he, like, kind of disengages and does his own thing after the whole Yankee Stadium thing. That's why they are able to split up and, and tackle everything, because Simon says, like, you know, there's no way they're going to do this. He's going to keep him busy for a while. I'm going to go do something else. Right. And meanwhile, fair. they're actually figuring it out and, you know, catching up with him. That 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 is fair. But you also have to think that he uh, at the end, he really does win, and McLean kind of gets back at him as a fluke almost. But I guess you could sum that up to him underestimating McLean and thinking already won. But Yeah. Well, I mean, he strapped him to a bomb. Yeah. I thought he was like, that's game over. Yeah. Uh, I didn't fall off a tower. Be. We're good. Uh, <laughs> Normally it would be. All right. Let's uh, move on with that story. Yeah. Within the tunnel, McLean kills some of Simon's men. Simon destroys a coffer dam, flooding the tunnel, but McLean escapes through a vent, ending up near Carver. After surviving a car chase with Simon's men who had followed Carver and finding the roll of quarters, they recognized that the roll of quarters would pay for a bridge toll, and they head to a tanker vessel in the Long Island Sound. They sneak aboard, learning that the bullion isn't there, and are captured by Simon and his crew. Simon confirms McLean's suspicions that the school bomb was a trick to distract from the police before handcuffing the two to the real bomb. He says he is going to destroy the tanker, redistributing the bullion across the Sound, to destroy the economies of the world. Uh, before Simon leaves, McLean jokingly asks him for some aspirin for his hangover, much to Simon's amusement. He happens to have a bottle of aspirin and tosses it to McLean. After Simon leaves, Carver manages to free them with a cable splinter. They barely escape before the bomb detonates, sinking the tanker. So, I was just complaining about all of these little conveniences. Mm-hmm. There's like There's like three of them in what I just read. For one, the aqueduct shooting McLean right up next to Carver. Yeah, that was the one. <laughs> then the roll of quarters. Oh, they must be at a bridge. And then the aspirin. Eventually, and when it shows like where the aspirin aspirin was from, that's mm-hmm. like then they knew where they would be. That's to me a bridge too far, just slightly. I think it's a little too heightened. Yeah, you know, it's it's a jump the shark that you don't realize until you really break it down. It's one of those moments that I think it would have been better. If the aspirin didn't, wasn't a clue. I liked that just as a funny moment. Right. Mm. You know, because I thought that was like, you know, that that was 
a good yeah. moment of levity in this serious situation. It didn't need to be a clue. They could have figured that out in some other way. You know? Yep. Yeah, I I uh I agree. I like what would what would have been bad about someone on the mic calling Simon as he leaves, like, hey, we'll meet you over here. Because they're already tied up. They're going to yeah. blow up. It doesn't matter where they are. I don't know. Strangely, I think it would have been better if they just left it as uh, this guy winning and Bruce Willis getting away with his life and just left it somewhat open to another one. The end. Uh, but you can't do that in the 90s. The action I hero know. has to win. I was also ready I to know. see him die. Like I, I, I was like, okay, let's kill this guy. I would have been mm-hmm. not happy if we didn't get to see that moment. On a completely fun tangent, Gruberoos would make a fun cereal. <laughs> Gruberoos. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got chocolate. Both, it's got both flavored. of them on the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you get two different flavors. You got chocolate flavored and strawberry flavored. And uh, but that's the thing. It'll be advertised as that, but it's not. It's actually going to be peanut or something. Oh yeah, I just I can imagine Hans Gruber like on the box, like falling backwards. What is twenty one out of forty two? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect for kids. Exactly the amount of cereal you're getting in this box. Yeah. Uh, at this point in the movie, we start to really ramp up the com- the communication and the back and forth between Simon and McLean. And it really starts to like feel like the Hans Gruber McLean yeah. relationship again, mm. where it, they really are going, you know, jab for jab. Of course, earlier they called out. Like, did you notice that his stutter went away for most of this movie? And then oh, it, came it back wasn't right at real. The end? That wasn't real. He he put it on as kind of yeah, part unaffected. of the play. Part of his oh. act. Yeah. So I'm just stupid. Well, they they referenced it <laughs> oh, later no. at the end where he was like pretending to have the stutter again to be funny. And he was oh, mocking. I thought that was just coming up again. And I was like, wow, that's a bad stutter. No, no. <laughs> No, it was just to uh, play into the hands of the police because they're always trying to figure out what kind of psychosis this, you know, bomber has or, you know, something like that. Maybe it's smarter than I gave it credit for. I'm just the dumb one. No, no, it's just smarter than you. (laughs) No, I I do think you're catching on to something, though, that I feel was missing a little bit was um, like he had this really cool, intricate plan, but I don't feel like it was really uh, not explained well enough, but advertised well enough mm. i I'm, I'm not sure i i think you there could have, the have right been PR. a for me it's there t- could have I, I feel like this is always my critique and maybe it's just me because this is the same one that pops up every time i always feel like i don't get enough time with the villains <laughs> like yeah. i mm. i really want to experience a little more of their world i guess yeah yeah that's a it was kind I, of a disappointing a little bit almost because you see you know, the, the level of planning in the beginning and, mm-hmm. you know, the bomb in the beginning is not only diversion and getting everything rolling, but it also, you know, takes down the seismic sensors and the Federal Reserve right. and all that stuff. So it's like there's levels of detail and then all that just for Simon to get sloppy and just like, you know, stop sticking with the plan and winging it at the end. It's kind of exactly. like, yeah. I thought this guy was one thing and now it's another, especially yeah. when, like you said, the stutter, the whole affected, you know, faint of, you know, trying to draw people in and stuff and then... Later on, it's just, yeah, well, and, then, and then you have the aspirin bottle kind of just, like, be the little right. clue on how everything happens. It's a little bit of a letdown in the end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually think one of his best character moments, though, happens towards the end of the movie, even though he does start to get overconfident and sloppy. Mm. Uh, the moment where Zeus gets the jump on him with the gun and how calm he is. Where it's like, you, oh, you need to disengage the sa- the safety, or I don't and know. And immediately what he told him. shoots him, yeah. and immediately shoots him. That that scene was like, oh, I got an insight into just how cool and collected this guy is yeah. in a high stress situation. And I don't know that that moment for me sold him completely as the villain. And that, but then he goes kind of a little overboard. <laughs> well, I, I for me, I thought that he just fell to his own hubris essentially because. Uh, John McClane's character is, he's hes a douchebag, and he says all this crap about his brother just purposefully inciting him, and the guy is all cool and collected for that, but he also, his brother can't help but get into it a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, Hans fell to his own hubris, too. Uh, mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. fell. He actually but, fell. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. But yeah, I just think his downfall was essentially himself more than it was uh, John McClane because he tossed that aspirin because he was going along with that joke. And yeah. I thought that that was fine. Okay. I didn't mm-hmm. find any problems. Uh, I wasn't like super bothered by get, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Villains get, you know, 
Yeah. Cocky. Cocky. It's what happens. It's. Yeah. You think this guy would be a little less cocky, though, seeing as how th- there's a history here of John McClane taking mm. out, you well, know, high profile terrorists. Well, yeah, but <laughs> not he's, once, twi- not twice. Actually, well, twice. Well, is well, exactly <laughs> twice. I don't know. He's exactly the type to get cocky because he's putting on this whole show. He's. There's no way very, he could do it. All of his actions time. are really grandiose. He is making him solve riddles and stuff. He's playing with his food the whole time. Yeah. He's cocky this whole time, and he has this whole plan going on. And sure, it gets the best of him at the end, but mm. I think it sticks with his character. Yeah. I think what kills him is his animal instinct. Because if you remember, he was following the psycho lady to a You're right. hotel room, and he tells the guy in the helicopter, take your time. That was yeah. his mistake. He didn't it's leave true. soon enough. True. It's true. So really, it was... Uh, it was carnal. It was, it was Katya. 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 Was his yeah. downfall. Yeah. Uh, so, backing up, let's talk about how this film is handling its action sequences in the latter portion, since this is an action movie. We have the whole aqueduct sequence, which I think is the weakest and does not hold up. It looks... It, it's like straight out of a cartoon, almost mm. the way it spits him out onto the... Onto the grass. Oh yeah, um, I forgot about that. That was a that was a. This is like a Die Hard two sequence, right? You know, it's a Die Hard two sequence in a Die Hard movie. That I like weird. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> die so, Hard and Die Hard. Yeah. The thing about this movie is, I think there are so many scenes that are are really good conceptually, but mm. I don't think they're drawn out enough. In, in my opinion, and this is one of them, the aqueduct where he's down there, he's by himself, you hear the dripping of the water, and when he gets out of the truck, um, he's looking down the tunnel and he can kind of hear, you know, the the water, mm-hmm. but he doesn't know exactly what it is, and then you see the lights start to shut off. Yeah, that was a cool effect. I was like, ooh, I like that, that's yeah. cool. I feel this anxiety for him where I'm like, oh, how are you going to get out of this? But yeah. it's so quickly resolved and he just grabs it, the grate and climbs up. <laughs> yeah, and and it kind of just uh, broke that whole sense of uh, thrill for me. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would have seen. I would have liked to see more of a struggle than oh, yeah, just yeah, spit him exactly. out right next to Carver. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Little, little poop hole just shot him out like a geyser. <laughs> it was something. It, it was a perilous thing that ended up actually benefiting him in right. the location uh, that it's, it sent it's, him. It was a little strange. Yeah. yeah, I think it was just in in my mind. It was kind of mimicking what happened in the second one, where you know he <laughs> ejects himself out of that plane in an explosion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at least that one was. Kept that tonal consistency right, of ridiculousness. Right, exactly. Yeah, that one was completely ridiculous. Yeah. I can kind of forgive, you know, it's like the single moment of levity that, you know, is just kind of silly. And I think it's a product of its times, you know. Mm-hmm. You've got the, the still, at you know, the surface level, you've got the goofy action that's just right. entertainment. I'm sure I'm wrong on this, but, you know, now we've got a little bit more, you've got action, but then it's like so super, super serious and everything is right. all, I mean, this was the 90s, so. Yeah, yeah. I think that was just a product of its times, and I didn't hate it. Like, it didn't take me out of it. It was, like, I laughed, and it's like, yeah, that's goofy, but <laughs> whatever. Yeah. The only thing that would have made it better, though, is if they, like, shot it from the top, and the, it does a freeze frame as it reaches the peak, and you just see his face like, oh, no! no he has to go, oh, sh-. That's what he says. There you go. Yeah. Sorry, kid-friendly. <laughs> and uh, then we have the another action sequence on the, the tanker, or the, the boat. And I, I thought this one was more effective, what, what happened here. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't as much action yeah. as... Uh, right. But we got to see but, um, Zeus have kind of a step up to the plate as more of a heroic figure. I did actually really like this part. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was ridiculous still, the way that they, you know, just took the cable from the truck, connected it with the boat, and then... Yeah, you know, zip lined down there, but it was still. And then the cable yeah. cuts that dude in half, which I thought was cool. But <laughs> other than the aqueduct, I think a lot of these scenarios they are conceptually ridiculous, but they did find a way to make it seem at least somewhat believable. You know, right. albeit mm-hmm. ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's a very good blend. Um, and and you're right because it does have that superficial silliness, but you know, that whole steel cable sequence, like. You know, snapping that guy in half is like, I really felt the realistic danger of that. And, right. Yeah. You know, McLean doesn't walk away unscathed, you know, as in so many other 
movies where they're zip lining with their bare hands and then nothing, you know, not a scratch on them. Here we like he's got the the wounds from that cable, like even later on, like the splinters. Oh yeah, I love that scene. Right. Blood, blood coming down his fingers. Ugh, so, ouch. Yeah, yeah and, uh. and he's limping and barely, you know, hanging on on that barge, like just right. because of what he's endured just from that cable sequence alone. Yeah. So, and and fun fact, they actually attached that truck to a boat and pulled it off of a bridge into the water. So that right. was that was real. I thought you were going to say they actually cut John's hands up. <laughs> like I actually, you got to do this the real way. A, a little <laughs> detail I really did like was I, I guess uh, Zeus was getting the McLean fever because he was saying, "Oh, I can jump that," you know. Yeah. And I'm doing this one first. I love yeah. that it was McLean that said basically no you can't let's do let's think <laughs> yeah. of another scenario yeah. like the the one person that we thought was completely ridiculous is saying you probably shouldn't yeah, let's, let's rein it in a little bit right. I, that would be me if i were other i could jump that far you would do that yeah. <laughs> except for if i can barely that, walk across a bridge if anything yeah. what broke the realism of it was a 90s era ram pickup truck not having a rust on it <laughs> there you go mm. <laughs> And that just kind of speaks to how much I love Zeus in this movie. Right. Yeah. He, he's uh, just one of my favorite additions. Just every chance he's on screen, I'm like, yeah, I, well, love, I, I love this guy. I love and how the car he, chase. Right. Yeah. yeah. Talking about the action, like, and the Yugo, too. Like, of all, like, all these car chases now, like, it's on a, you know, a sports bike or some supercar. Like, this is a right. Yugo. And they're, like, talking about hot wiring it. And it's like, oh, you've got an airbag. Well, at least on your side. Speaking of but that the, the part, the street so smarts good. of it too, like you know, pull the ABS yeah. views so I can you know get into a drift here. Like <laughs> it's it's dumb, but it's like it also lends like we talked about McLean's like resourcefulness. So right, mm, yeah, it, it's a really like, good balance of the silliness and the realism of the action. Yeah, yeah. I I appreciate that about Irina. You were gonna say something? In oh no, not scene. really. I, yeah. I was just saying I love that part. The um, like, does this have? <laughs> Does this have airbags? He's like, well, on your side, I don't think on mine. But immediately, like the, the last coming. scene you see is um, Zeus looking at him like, what? <laughs> like, what are you about to do? And then the next scene is just the car being launched <laughs> yeah. out. This <laughs> it's so good. good. I, I, but the thing I love most about his character is that at first he's just there and he's regretting everything and he's hating it and he doesn't want to be there. At, but... You know, he keeps putting himself back into it. Yes. Yeah, and, he kind no, of I was enjoys just, it. <laughs> I was just going to comment on that, and I think there's actually subtlety to his performance that I really like. Right. Because on paper, he does not want to be there. But you catch on to these little character moments where, mm -hmm. you know, especially at, you see it first at the phone booth where Zeus is walking away, and McLean is like, okay, I need you more than you need me. And... Almost not immediately, but when he comes over, he's like, "All right, let's listen to this this clue that this yeah. guy's giving to us." And there's mm -hmm. almost you can almost see this like excitement. He's yeah, like working yeah, exactly. it out in his mind. He's like he's into it. Yeah, uh, almost immediately, and he does that throughout this, where he's like oh, he yeah. just starts to he kind of not it. enjoy it, but he's he's like excited to be a part of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I totally get that feeling too. So mm -hmm. uh, McLean and Zeus are captured. They get tied to the bomb. Simon says that the <laughs> yeah I know. every every time you yeah. say it, yeah. yeah Simon says that the uh, bomb in the school was not real as a diversion and it was more just to get him and later on just to also still he tells them he, that he's just gonna sin sink all the money make it sink to the bottom of the lake mm. uh, but it's they're actually gonna go steal it then they get out and the boat blows up and they barely escape once more cool explosion I liked it. Oh, really? Yeah. Fire pretty. Mm -hmm. Fire, Fire pretty. pretty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I thought this was a pretty engaging moment in the movie. You learn a lot of things. The, the whole aspirin bottle sequen scene. Mm -hmm. Sequence. <laughs> it was a sequence. Mm -hmm. It was a sequence when he tossed the aspirin bottle to him. <laughs> <laughs> he, One, he said the thing. Two, yeah. it was thrown. Three, he caught it. <laughs> yep. Action sequence. sequence. Well, four, <laughs> it took five days to shoot. It was arduous. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Jackson kept requiring them to reshoot. <laughs> Bruce Willis Jeremy almost Irons lost an eye. <laughs> needed a someone to show him how to throw. It was a yeah. hand double. He had to train a an double. hour a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just not right. No, <laughs> it's got to be natural. As far as explosions go, though, I heard they toned it back in this movie uh, after the fact 
because of the Oklahoma City bombings. I don't know if you guys heard about that. It was, I heard it was they, the same year. I don't know if they toned wow. down the explosion, but they didn't discuss it when when it was brought well, up. Was, no, the thing was, that at least in the little I read, that they were going to have a little bit more in the middle, and they cut those back, and then they were going to completely take out the intro bombing. And that was like, the final cut was supposed to be that off, and then they added it at the last second. Mm. I think 20th Century Fox was like, you know what? We are not associated with it. We we did this before the the bombing happened, uh, but you're right. They also chose not so, to discuss it. That's interesting. There were there were movies that similar to 9/11, where the Oklahoma bombing was like I guess the the previous big thing, big yeah. thing that affected movies afterwards. I, I wonder right. if there's any other ones that had to change because uh, of that. Because of, yeah, yeah, very possible. Well, there were. I mean, the first World Trade Center truck bomb was 93 too. So I'm sure. And it was interesting seeing, you know, several shots of the, you know, the towers in the background in this movie. Yeah. Uh, going back and seeing that, but yeah, I mean, there's, I guess, that certain aspect of sensitivity too. Well, that bomb, I, the bombing at the beginning is still kind of like visceral and yeah. real. Seeming. Oh, it, it is, is pretty intense. Definitely. Like it's, yeah. That that's the most realistic moment in. It's- out of all the the set pieces in this movie, it's very realistic just because of how simple it is mm-hmm. almost you know kind of that unexpected quality where in a action film you're used to seeing oh look some shady people walking around in you know a public place what's going to happen oh no a bomb <laughs> but this one is just in the middle of your life an explosion goes off yeah. you know mm-hmm. which is realistic yeah and the the school evacuation too like the stress in the principal yeah. and the teacher's eyes like when they have them all assembled like Trying like that just felt real too. Yeah, very yeah. realistic. So that that was very good acting on their part as well. Yeah, this movie it, it's a it's a good balance of you know typical action movie fare and realism. Mm-hmm. Like I think today there's two things that still hold up about this movie, and we didn't really discuss it, but this movie kind of does the tries to break the race barrier throughout yeah. the throughout the movie between uh, McLean and Zeus. Yeah. There's constantly these, like, they're having these back and forths about, like, yeah. well, you're black, I'm white, all this stuff. And yeah. I feel like the, all of their interactions are very relevant to today, yeah. too. Mm. Uh, especially the moment in the beginning yeah. where, uh, oh, you, you saved me, so you must care for me at least a little. He's like, oh, no, I don't care about you. I saved you because you were in a black neighborhood, and if you died... Uh, then there'd be a thousand police officers here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was like... Tension but, would be high. But yeah, yeah, this movie, it's weirdly relevant today in that sense as well. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yeah. No, it really but, is. And I don't know if it's a theme for the whole series as a whole, but I mean, the first two had a black and white partnership as definitely. well. Definitely. It was pretty yeah. prevalent, so... Yeah. Um, are y'all ready to close this one out? Yes. Indeed. As McLean and Carver are debriefed by the police, McLean reports that none of the bullion was on the tanker. McLean notices the bottle of aspirin came from a truck stop located in Quebec at the Canada-U.S. border. McLean, Carver, and the police arrive at a warehouse near the truck stop where Simon and his men are in the process of distributing the bullion and planning their escape. The rest of Simon's men are captured, while Simon and his girlfriend Katya attempt to escape in a helicopter. McLean shoots an overhead power line that falls onto the helicopter, destroying it and killing Simon and Katya. After celebrating their triumph, Carver convinces McLean to call his estranged wife, Holly. Uh, all right. What did y'all think of the end of this movie? For me, it kind of, it almost felt tacked on, even though it was something that needed to happen. I agree. Because everything that happened post-explosion of the ship felt like, oh, no, that didn't, oh, that wasn't the end? Oh, yeah, we. Th- right. I guess Simon is still alive. Yeah. <laughs> we got to see what happens with him. But it did seem like... Oh, this is the epilogue, but it's also crucial to right. <laughs> what's happening. I uh, kind of did like the idea of ending it. I, I think you mentioned earlier, but ending it with, yeah, the bad guy got away. Oh, that was this that time, was me. or that yeah. was you. Yeah, but um, I think the I I liked the concept of um, you know, his newfound friend Zeus saying, "Hey, you're alive." Like, what are you talking about? You know, like, you survived all this. Yeah. Like, that's the big thing to take away from here. And mm-hmm. I, I like that as a message. Like, yeah, me I, I get wanting to wrap it up with the villain, you know, in handcuffs or killed, whatever mm-hmm. suits your fancy. But um, 
I kind of think that's a that would have been an interesting change from you know a typical action hero film where you always nab the bad guy but uh the message of this would be you don't always get them for now yeah. but you know what is the important thing yeah i, I liked that i agree yeah i would yeah. i i think i would have preferred it if it had ended that way however i still wasn't upset with how it did end. so yeah i think the pro the the reason for this seeming tacked on is because once the explosion has happened, you realize that the school bombings are not going to happen. It was fake. Mm-hmm. The tension is taken away yeah. by that happening. Right. So you're like, oh, what? There, there's no stakes anymore. It's just, oh, we have to stop the bad guy from getting away right. with money. Like, mm. that's, that's it. That's all. <laughs> no, no lives are at stake anymore. Yeah. So it just, as a result, comes off feeling yeah. like low... Well, right stakes also the the sacrifices made by those trying to protect the children that was kind of diminished because oh it's just pancake syrup there wasn't really a bomb like (laughs) and that that was a tense moment too where he's defusing the bomb and he was he said i'm gonna stay and he's like like, no guts no glory i like that guy almost the best out of some of these side Uh, characters yeah he was so great i did like him i didn't like him at first when he was like he threw the freaking formula at the chair. I was like, that's not well, a good no, idea. No, I, I kind of liked it because everyone's mad at him and yelling, and he's kind of like... <laughs> he's yeah, just a little, what he's is a little that, off his rocker. That is not something you would do. That's no. That's a bomb expert for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't a huge explosion. No, but I mean, the, you're the in a thing police is... Department. Y- <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not the smartest idea, but it's not any McClane shooting blanks at the... Hey, we don't talk about that. Well, this is a different movie. <laughs> I like maybe it's not a good idea, but I like him for it. Me too. Right. I, I actually think. Yeah, it, I, I get it. Charm. I think the the way they did it, it was okay. Like because mm. he's he's a little he's off. <laughs> oh, uh, and did this the uh, random sex scene seem out of place to y'all? Yes. yes. The whole concept yeah, thing was just unnecessary. There, there's a reason for that. Apparently, the director knew the movie was going to be rated R and just decided, well, since it's going to be rated R, let's just throw a sex scene <laughs> Might as well. That makes it so much better, actually. <laughs> like, I love that. <laughs> Might so as well at this it point. It was point, literally pointless. That yeah. was from the director's lips. That's <laughs> so funny. I, I lo- I act- that actually, see, that to me, that was a bit of a negative. Uh-huh. I still think that it's a negative. It, well, to me, that made it more of a Is, positive. Does Katya okay. have any lines, kind of guys? Uh, she yells. <laughs> when she's shooting and she but has a it. scarred neck which you wonder like was it did she have more of a so part I, like what was i honestly i i honestly found her interesting because she's clearly a sociopath like there's there's something wrong with that lady yeah. she's got the you crazy know? eyes i i actually love the scene where she's slicing that guy up and he says i think he's dead you can yeah. stop <laughs> like, yeah. that it went into like a guillermo del toro Esque yeah, action sequence with where the it's just a bunch of and, moves yeah. and slices and yeah. I was just like, what what movie am I in right now? <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. I would have liked to see her more. Actually, she's a psycho and she's attracted to power. That's her thing. Yeah. So that's your thing. <laughs> also, so, also but, sorry to start that sex scene. I think she pounces on him like to. Ta- I thought she was gonna double cross and then kill him, but no, she just wanted the sex. No. Yeah. It was you just remember that though? Was like she like yeah. tackles him from behind. No, no, no they're just aggressive. That's, yeah. That's well, that, that was a that was kind of a throwback to whenever she first attacks him. Yeah. yeah. And is like different this time because yeah. she was like, Ugh, make love with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, the McLean and. Zeus catch up to Simon and basically he shoots the electrical wire it says say hello to your brother helicopter goes down big explosion cut to credits pretty much after he calls Holly the Which end you don't even hear her voice I don't think I no, you do hear her. but I don't think it's her yeah it's like the, the sound of her voice she says like God damn it, McLean. Or she said, yeah, it was, it was something like that for a split second. It yeah. was not her. I know it wasn't her just by the sound of it. But mm. there you go. That's the movie. Uh, do you all have any final thoughts on uh, the end? I, I actually really liked his line to Simon before he goes down. That you know, oh, say hello yeah. to your brother. Yeah, mm. <laughs> I think I, uh, the Yippie Kaye part was the out of all the movies so far is the least satisfying Yippie Kaye. We should rate the Yippie Kaye's. I thought the I'm second one was just worse. It's obligatory at this point. Oh, yeah, no, exactly. I like that he uses it. I'm glad it's a thing, but if I'm going to rate them based on how satisfying it was, this time he used it when no one was there, 
in the first that's, two movies, that's he the actually. Best. No, he says it to the people in both movies. No, but this. he ain't need no one. Yeah, uh-huh. he's just saying it to himself. Yeah. So I I don't know. I thought the second one was the least satisfying but because why? it was just like it was obviously there to you know capitalize yeah. on the first one, and then it didn't feel like his heart was into it, and it wasn't the right moment. I disagree completely. Well, you are. All right, let's just say opinion. one is the best, yes. and then two and three are uh, up for grabs. Yes. Okay. I, I thought I We'll thought wait for four. Actually, I, I remember four, so that one was pretty good. What's fives? Ugh, I can't. Can't wait. I can, I, I can wait. <laughs> you will wait. Uh, all right, final thoughts? Oh, um, well, one last thing. It's just another remark on McLean's character. Just the last little mm-hmm. closing thought. The second one, you know, they had him do... He, he was pretty much uh, an Avenger. And uh, yeah. and they brought him back down to a little bit of an everyman in this one. And that is really displayed in the helicopter scene. Whenever, instead of just, you know, going at this guy and uh, just, like, having super-duper precision and shooting him through the window of a helicopter, he, like... Shoots the. He has super precision for the <laughs> electrical cable. Okay, but, <laughs> but here's the thing: people can make that shot. Like, yeah. I feel like both shots are. I feel like both of them were kind of crazy all right, shots. All right, all right, it's 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 a really good shot, but it's not a moving flying vehicle with a machine right. gun shooting at you. But I think it's it's almost a bigger risk to you know do the yeah. yeah to be to shoot a cable and oh this cable will fall directly into the well yeah it was it was pinned in by the. Uh, thing yeah yeah like also i would have held off on the line say hello to your brother until like i knew the chopper was going down yeah he says it like before he even does the move which i guess it's still more satisfying he was caught up in that moment where he knows this is gonna work the thing is though we can chalk it up to him being a good shot no matter what and he wanted a little fun with it i mean i guess i i it it was just like more, I guess it's more yeah. satisfying. It was uh, no, you're you're right. It was more satisfying. It would yeah. not be satisfying if he just shot him in the head and it fabrication went. Yeah. is often more enjoyable than what was real. Yes, I all I know is it was a it was a satisfying end for me to that character. I liked seeing Simon go down, yeah. even if it seemed like you know the movie went on maybe ten minutes more than it should have right. past yeah. its ending mark. I agree. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break, and on the other end, we're going to get into our reviews, uh, what the critics thought, what the box office was, and uh, where this franchise stands at its third installment. Welcome back. Let's talk Die Hard with a Vengeance. With a Vengeance. Is that First, what we're, we're talking do about? our scores. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, this whole time. You have been a little quiet on this one. What? What's up? <laughs> Man, I hear I was waiting to talk about the stuck pig scene. The stuffed pig scene. Stuck what? pig from uh, Deliverance. Oh, God. That's not <laughs> oh, even... How do you get that? They both end in ints. <laughs> That's that's the connection. <laughs> yeah, it's either that or the second Ghost Rider. Oh yeah, Spirit of Vengeance. Hey, at least that's the full word. Yeah. <laughs> I love how uh, late this one. All was. right, I'm excited for your Deliverance review. David, you've got our reviews in a bowl there. You want to pull them at random? Uh, I do, and I will. First score. Irina coming in with an eight point five. Nice. Yeah. So I think this is a positive one. There are a lot of good moments to enjoy from this movie and definitely a step up for me from the second. And I almost consider the second as just kind of a a different exploration of John McClane. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that the director did a good job of trying to follow up the first film with a new scenario that is believable. He did his best to bring back the McClane we all know and love. I think for me, what doesn't make uh, this a perfect 10 is the fact that I think it tried to juggle a lot of elements that it couldn't give enough attention to all of those elements at once. Yeah. It did a very good balance. 
And I do appreciate that. But there's, for me, I enjoy a little more of the theatrics with trying to figure out puzzles, trying to follow mm-hmm. the clues to the destination. You like I, it to have a brain yeah, along with the, a, the brawn. Yeah, a little more. And, and, and that's not to say that makes this a lesser film. I, I think it's a very good action film. But to try and combine the two, they balanced it well. But I... I don't really like combining those in my personal preference. So. Yeah. Unless it's, as you said, fluidly done like it was with the first Die the, Hard. The first was a really great, and I I love the first. But um, this one is a good follow-up, honestly. Yeah. But 8.5. I don't know. Probably the my best kind of are... sequel. No, probably the best kind of sequel you could ask for for a classic. Yeah. You know, like, it's like almost impossible to make the perfect sequel to die hard exactly but they mm. this seems like a, a good candidate yeah for... i would i would definitely not skip this one yeah all right next one next up following in line aj with an 8.5 hey look at that maybe you can there explain you it better than i did <laughs> so irena i'm gonna follow her um her cue the the thing is the balance of it the action and the, the character the heart of it the realism and the the adventure part of it. The first one did that excellently. This third movie here is a return to form from the second one. You know, the de- we we had a departure of, you know, the we lost the character from McLean, and it's a, in favor of all action here. We return to that. I wish we had a little bit more Holly. Maybe you know some more missed phone calls in between. That's kind of drawn his mind away from things. That kind of uh, rounds him out a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. This movie, in all fairness, I try to watch every movie every week a couple times. One, to have establish an emotional baseline. Second time with more of a critical, analytical viewing. Uh, this one, I only got a chance to, to view it once. So I'm going based on emotion, really. And it was positive, don't get me wrong. Um, and I mm-hmm. think my score might even actually go up. Because as we're talking about it now and re-watching it, talking about the, you know, the details of it, I, I really appreciate some of the similar things that I appreciated from the first one that really surprised me seeing in an action movie. Um, but I, I, I think that the key word here is the balance of it. You know, we see McLean as uh, a human, uh, you know, struggling to survive on his own as an individual. Um, and then also, you know, saving the world kind of thing. So <laughs> we return with the motif also that I think McTiernan put in the first one of, you know, kind of the blue collar versus the, you know, the higher level of the world, like, and we here we have a collaboration of that. We have, you know, the construction workers, everything, you know, proving their intelligence, you know, knowing the 21st president's Arthur um, and, and all that stuff and the history of the aqueduct. Like, I think all those things are really kind of underlying motifs that really flesh out, you know, a well-rounded movie um, with action, like um, mm-hmm. that make it, you know, kind of stand the test of time and, you know, want, to it makes me want to rewatch it because it is more lasting than you know the second mm-hmm. movie which is pure action and it, but it's forgettable for me so i think there's a big gulf in between the second movie and this uh because of you know what was lacking in the second was the heart of it the character development uh that kind of mm-hmm. thing and you know the rapport that mclean builds with other people um and and you know kind of coming to terms with his own struggles as well. We see that a little bit here again. I would have liked to see a little bit more of it. That's kind of why it, you know, it falls a little bit short from the first, but you know, to their credit, like we've all said, you know, how do you follow up with Die Hard, which, you know, arguably could have just been a standalone movie and still been excellent. Like it didn't necessarily need a follow up, but of course, you know, they're going to want to cash in on that, but this is more of the same of the heart of the, the first movie while putting a new enough spin on it that it's just not a retread. And so I do appreciate right, that yeah. as well. So, yeah, I, I feel like eight, eight and a half is a, a pretty good gut um, score for me on this, you know, with the, the possibility of potentially going up um, because of all those little details that still, you know, you can, you can chew on in a rewatch and, and appreciate more and more because there's that substance behind it besides, you know, just shooting and, and explosions to kind of distill the second one. Yeah. Right. The, the ending, like we said, does feel a little bit tacked on um, and I reset it uh, earlier. And I agree that the middle kind of could have been tightened up pace wise, loses a little bit of momentum. 
so there, there's definitely some polishing that could have been um, done to help out with it. The whole Katya thing, like she was interesting and I feel like we should have uh, either got more of her or her not at all. And then the whole betrayal right. of, you know, the other villain. And I don't even remember his name. It was just like kind of, I don't know. It just was too much complication at the end that was unnecessary. But, you know, we still got that poignant bow on the whole package with the phone call at the end. And I, I appreciated that. So we kind of book in that yeah. with, you know, his reseparation with Holly. And then, you know, the redemption aspect of it is still there. I just wanted to see more of it. Yeah. All right. All right. Next up, David within 7.5. Within 7.5. Yeah. So this is one where, you know, I was between 7 and 7.5. Um, I think I gave the last one a 7.5. So I'd say this is pretty fair for, for me. In the end, they had their own struggles. And I know that in on paper, this one probably do better for most people. But it just fell flat in a lot of areas for me that, you know, overall, it was still engaging. I didn't lose interest. I had fun with it. I think Samuel L. Jackson is fun to have in any movie. So he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I don't think Bruce Willis was doing as much. Um, And the second movie, because, you know, I'm doing a sort of a side-by-side comparison, had less realistic diehard feel, but had more bombastic scenes that, for some reason, is more memorable to me. Like Yeti football? Yeah, like Yeti football or icicles <laughs> through the eye or, you know, anything involving from an snow airplane. or ice. Yeah, I can't. I'm, maybe I'm into that. Maybe that's my thing. Yeah. He just mm. likes snow. He misses so, it. So the point is, I think that one, if I'm going to watch one of these, I might go for the second one just for the sake of bombastic fun. But in the end, the first one just trumps them both. And I'm not going to watch all the Die Hard, so I might just have to go back to the first one. Mm. But, you know, is in the end, it's not bad. Mm-hmm. It is. I don't think I ever lost interest. So seven point five. It's pretty good. Pretty good. All it's right, pretty good. Enough. Pretty good. Point five better than Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which you gave a seven to. I but did. Let's move on to the yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. I like. I like how we did this. <laughs> Yeti football. This time. Yep. <laughs> Noah with a nine. Damn. You're darn right. I gave this movie a nine, and it deserves it. All right. Eh. I think yeah, we found. I up. think we found the fran- a franchise that kind of speaks to you. Yeah. Like, each film, you've been like, you know, I like this movie. I do. <laughs> yeah. Because they're good. I mean, the second one. I okay. Retroactively, I'd probably rate the second one a little lower after this one. Mm-hmm. Like I might give that movie a, a seven if I had to. But uh, I I like this movie a lot. I thought that uh, you know okay. It's really hard to put it at a nine because I put the first one at a nine as well. Mm-hmm. But I, I think nine is appropriate because of all the things that this movie has achieved with, you know, the villain. Like ha- having a villain that can amount to as good as Hans Gruber was in the first one is no small achievement. Had to be his brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and yes, it was his brother. And when Very did fitting. the first movie come out again? Can you remind 89? me? 89? Yeah, 89, and this was 89. 95. No, so. 88. Sorry, 88. I 88? think it's 88. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. this is seven years after. Yeah, so seven years after. I felt like this was the true sequel to the first Die Hard, uh, which, you know, you can't you can't really do better than the first one because it's completely original, and yep. as uh, AJ has said, it does stand on its own. But this one... I didn't feel like it had any of the real gimmicks that the second one had. It doesn't really play around with stupid plot devices and mm-hmm. all that. Sure, there's like a couple of scenes in there that you can say like, "Well, this like this wouldn't have happened in real life like that." But it but that's kind of the fun of the Die Hard series. Yeah. And uh, you just have three huge actors that have lots of charisma. You like their whole rapport with each other all eat like it's like rock paper scissors each one like compliments the other yeah or, that's mm-hmm. a that's a good metaphor you know. for this honestly uh, <laughs> and uh i don't know i just i just uh i i just was happy with this movie and yeah. uh, i think it like aj said is a return to form with the first one and i'll keep my nine awesome. yeah that sounds good to me yeah. all righty and last but not least Jumping on board the seven train is Reese with a seven point five. Let's go. Oh. Now, before you get too excited, oh, I no. think what you mean 
like our ideas of what makes a seven seven point five are slightly different. <laughs> like to me, seven point five is still pretty darn good. That's what I said. Yeah, but I, I don't know. There, I, I think there's a you know the a murkier area there. But I think murkier in the sense that I didn't like this one as much as the second one in a way. Yeah, but which... I, 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 and I think I gave Die Hard two a seven. So this is an uptick from the second one. But it all it, it detracts in certain areas that Die Hard 2 doesn't, but it also builds up more in a positive way than I think Die Hard 2 did. Uh, so it's ultimately a net more positive than the second one. Right. Uh, so the things this movie does really well is it adds in, as we've all said before, more key players that are memorable that Die Hard 2 did not have. Mm. We have Simon and we have Zeus. These other two... And I'm going to take what you said. They, it is the rock, paper, scissors dynamic. It's like this triangle yeah. of like, they all affect one another in different ways. Mm-hmm. And I do, I, I really appreciate that dynamic in this movie. I like that this film takes certain elements from the first Die Hard and certain elements from the second one. It takes, you know, the bombastic action sequences from the second one, but it tones them down a little bit to a, an, an area that seems a little more believable. Whereas in two, it was just straight up insanity at certain areas and in the first one it takes the it it restores the everyman john mcclain that we know and love and it and it also sets up its scenario in a more believable way it's not just him coincidentally Mm -hmm. finding himself in this other you know terrorist act which would be insane if that happened in the third movie and it wasn't connected in some sort of way to one of his previous enemies yeah uh, yeah the, the, it's tied to simon who is the brother of hans gruber simon is pissed off thus creating this the narrative in this movie and it, it, it makes sense and i'm on board with you know this new cat and mouse game uh the the moments where i think this movie falters is I think it relies on convenience way too much. Like, that's where this movie is trying to be slightly more believable than the second one, yet they're running into into all these convenient situations that get them right where they need to be at the right time that it just kind of strains credulity a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I also brush up against how the final act feels tacked on at the end. Like, it's, it's not as satisfying as it should be to see Simon get killed right. like it because it, it feels like it's like you need to conflate the ship explosion with simon's death in some way like right. he needs to die on that boat yeah or something needs to happen in, in that and that would be a more satisfying like bang this is that's the mm-hmm. end of the movie i'll agree on that point yeah and again the the, the pacing in the middle it, it's it is as arena said less focused like it's less fluid than the first movie i would say even less focused than the second one mm-hmm um, but th- those are really, it- it's not like it's, you can't understand what's going on. It, it just feels like it, there's more, there's more going on and it. it's not as good at facilitating all of it. Right. Uh, but other than that, I-, I-, I really enjoy this movie. I think it's better than the second one. It continues on tonally consistently with the first one. And it, it kind of rejuvenates the franchise for me. And it's like, oh, may- maybe, you know, McLean can go on in more movies. Like, maybe there is a justifiable reason to keep this character going, and there is more franchise potential. Whereas in the second one, it just seemed like, oh, you, you can't make a sequel to Die Hard. Like, this, like yeah, this is a fun action movie, but it's not, like, that's not the John McClane I know. Mm. But, so, so yeah, this one, like, I think it restores the faith, and it gets an extra .5 over that, over the second one for that, so... Yeah, cool. not gonna change your score to an eight point oh. No, I I really like this movie, but I do think it has flaws. I, I mean, do I do like right, it more than the second yeah, one. Fair I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, AJ, you want to crunch those numbers? All right. So we have a group average of eight point two, and then just for reference, first Die Hard we had a nine point four, second one a six point seven, and uh, again eight point two for the third one. We're all over the place on this one. Mm. That puts it at, uh, looks like it's tied with Interview with the Vampire. um, And that is also just below The Hateful Eight and above Ocean's 13. All right. All right. That's good company. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I can see that. All right. So let's move on to critics. 
Uh, this is where David and I, I hate saying I because I like this movie, but David is slightly validated. You also like this movie. I like this movie. But the critics trended more towards your feeling than, you know, mm. Noah, Irina, and AJ's. Yeah. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, 59%. What? Yep. Dang, This was man. the first movie in the franchise to get rotten, though barely. Mm. Just barely. What? Mm. Yep. And an audience score of 83%. On Metacritic, it has a 58 with an audience score of 8.7. And on IMDb, it has a 7.6. Uh, this is where I should note that this movie has the most, the, the highest ratio of defenders. Oh, okay. Like, it's mm. like, no, Die Hard with a Vengeance is the best sequel yeah. of the whole franchise. Like, second, it's the one that, the, the one is second to Die Hard. Mm. And uh, you'll if you go online, you will find a lot of defenders of this movie, and that's why you see the audience score so high on this one. Right. Uh, it's also a thing that I think retroactively even critics have started to warm up to because I do mm. believe this this fifty nine percent score used to be even lower. So it is. It seems like it's on an upwards trajectory. I mean, I do think you can still post review or critics can still post reviews for old movies. So who knows? Maybe someday this will be in the fresh. Uh, but if you want to compare it to uh, Rotten Tomatoes, at least, to the other diehards, the first diehard, I believe, had a 94%, and the second diehard had mm -hmm. a 69%. As a frame of reference for the way things age well, that kind of reminds me of when we were going over the Dollars trilogy, and yes. how at the time of their release, critics absolutely trashed it. They yeah. hated it. Yeah. <laughs> but now they'll all say those are great. Yeah, exactly. And this is also in the company of several other action movies, so it's almost like... right you know, just piling on with more of the same at the time. That is a good point to bring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just, I, I am kind of like baffled. Maybe it was something in me thinks it was probably fatigue of the franchise mm. that had something to do with the lower score where it was like, oh, you've got, you've done two of these already. You're doing a third one. Does that really need to happen? <laughs> Seven years after uh, the first. <laughs> but who knows? I, I don't know. I, I can't honestly say, but. Let's move on to the old box office. This movie opened May 19th, 1995, against a movie I've never heard of called Forget Paris, uh, also playing in theaters Forgotten. at the time, mm -hmm. <clears throat> were uh, Crimson Tide and uh, While You Were Sleeping, which are both Disney movies, weirdly, or at least owned by Disney. Uh, this movie had a budget of $90 million, which inflated is $153 million. So that's your kind of typical big budget yeah. mm. uh, movie. And uh, worldwide, guys, worldwide, what did this movie do? We're going to go with David first. Did we have a budget? Yeah, $90 million, but inflated to $153 million. Uh, oh. Do you all want to do... I want Let's do inflated. Do you want to do inflated or not inflated? Let's just be consistent. We've been doing inflated. Yeah. All right, yeah. we're going to stick with inflated. I have both numbers here anyway, so that's good. Uh, inflated budget. Today, I mean, inflated worldwide total. What would it make today? Uh, I'm gonna go with 500 million. 500 million, going yeah. big. I think that this movie did well. It has big name actors. I did hear that Samuel L. Jackson, or I think it was him, who was built up there with him. So they, with all the big names and the fact that the first two did really well, I think this one, regardless of whether or not the critics liked it, did better than expected. All right, Arena. Um, three eighty. 380? Yeah. Noah. So you said 150? 150 inflated budget. Released May. Gosh, I feel like uh I feel like David's almost right on the money. Um but I'll go a little high. All right. With 510. 510. <laughs> Going even higher. AJ. Uh it's, I'll I'll stick with Noah here and say 500. Wait, no, I said 500. David said 500. Did you? I thought you said 450. Uh, so, no, I said 500. He said uh, 500. Okay, well, <laughs> let's stick with tradition and uh, box Noah, and so I'll say 520. <laughs> 520, going right ah, over Noah. I hate that. <laughs> and that's going to make you very mad, Noah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's so annoying. Because I went high on purpose. Yeah, Man. so the movie... Even AJ wasn't close. I was close. way off. <laughs> Is it like 700? No, this movie made 625 Dang. million. That's in it, again in inflated dollars. I still thought I was aiming pretty high with my 500. Well, yeah. I, I thought you were right around the range. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, 
back in the day in 1995 it was 366 million uh Gosh. it grossed 100 million in the u.s which was actually lower than die hard 2 but it did so much better overseas yeah so that that resulted in the inflated worldwide total of 625 million that is a good take today like yeah, if, if a movie does that good. if an action movie like Die Hard did that today. Mm. That's in- incredibly successful. What? So, so how did it take twelve we'll get years? Into it. Or we won't. <laughs> I don't think we will. We'll wait until next so, time. This, yeah, this was the last one, right? Yeah, this wrong. Is, yeah, this is so six hundred twenty-five million. You'd think like, oh yeah, we're get that sequel right into production. Let's uh, get it out in two years. But no, it would be twelve years until we see the next Die Hard film, and unfortunately. Maybe I'm just a crappy researcher, but I don't know why it took them so long. I to tried do a to sequel. do like in the break. Was I tried it, to look it up. Was it yeah. the same director still? Okay. Fourth one, no. Fourth one's going to be a different director. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it took it, it took they took a 12 year hiatus from the Die Hard franchise, even though this one is technically the highest grossing of all of them. Uh, mm. mo- probably most successful. The budget actually wasn't even that much higher than the second one. I think the second one was at like a 70 million budget. So they pumped it up 20 million. Okay. And that's probably just them adding two more big stars to the movie. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that Wait. for some reason, Hey, if you're a listener and you know the backstory to why this is, tell me, I'm actually curious or maybe I'll just do further research and I should have been more prepared. <laughs> I did try to hey. look it up and I couldn't find anything. Reese, yeah. I did my research and, this was the last one. Oh, there's no more. Yeah, there's no more. <laughs> uh, there's no more with with uh, John McClane with hair. We'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, good Die Hard movies. John McClane has hair. That's arguable though, because his he had only a other little bit movies. Of hair. Hey, uh, live for your Die Hard. Doesn't have hair. If I I haven't seen it in a while, but if I remember correctly, that I really liked that one. I did too. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. No, when's the last time you watched Live for Your Die Hard? A while ago, but I'm remembering scenes and thinking, like, back then I was okay with it. I think. But now I remember specific things. I'm thinking. My two <sighs> strongest memories are Flyleaf mm-hmm. and Car launching into a helicopter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's that really cool scene in that tunnel, though, where uh, the two cars are. Hit, like the cars flipped up in the air and the two cars hit and it just uh, stops are we, it. Are we yeah, reviewing Live for Your Die no, Hard? No, no we're not. From that. That, cool that. action does not necessarily Nef- make good movie. Necessarily. If, okay, I'm not I'm not reviewing it, but if I <laughs> I actually fine. think John McClane, Bruce Willis is on point in that movie. Okay. Like the we will the thing I remember about that movie is that the humor is restored and his, he has like some of the best lines in that All movie. All right. We will see. We'll see. We'll see. Mm. But I, I'm, I'm willing. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm going to go to bat for that one. We're betting. I don't yeah. think the humor was yeah. lacking right. in this one, though. No, no it's, it's not. not. Okay. But like he, he's, he's got some genuinely, in my opinion, almost laugh out loud moments in in four. All right, let's let's bet right now. I bet that the next movie, we're both going to have a more negative score than the previous three movies. I, in my case, like you think my score will yes. be lower. Okay, I'll bet, bet you that. Money, I'll bet money. Right. money. And I'm. This is. We Five cannot bucks. adjust to win the million. bet. Okay. okay. We cannot adjust. We have to be yeah, perfectly exactly. honest with I agree. ourselves. I agree. Okay? This is a no stakes bet. We don't win anything from winning. <sighs> just. Okay. Fine. Okay. okay. Beer. Shake. Shake it. Beer. Beer. All right. Fine. <laughs> there we go. A okay. gentleman's wager. Right. Huzzah! So. We do. I don't know why this movie took 12 years to come out or why it took 12 years for them to make a sequel. It could be that just Bruce Willis was asking for a lot because if I, I, I think Bruce Willis is kind of a prickly character mm-hmm. in real life. I think he's he runs <laughs> he's a, a hard a prick. Yeah, he <laughs> he runs a hard bargain. And I and this is evident from the very first Die Hard where. He asked for five million dollars, which was unheard of for like a no-name star, yeah. and he got it. So maybe that kind of enabled him, and you know, who knows? Maybe John McTiernan was interested in doing the sequel, but was like, "Hey, just wait a little bit. Hey, just wait a little bit. Hey, just wait a little bit," and it mm. just kind of never came together. Because I'm sure the studio was interested in make. They're, they're never going to say no to money. It like, could be that McTiernan just wanted to focus on other projects too. Yeah. I have a feeling, and this is completely speculative. 
that it is a Bruce Willis deal. Right. Like, I, I just have a feeling he's the reason it took so long. And they can't have Die Hard without Bruce Willis. Mm, yeah. Too late. Even though it's apparently his favorite role to play. Mm-hmm. Like, he in interviews, he says, like, yeah, John McClane's my favorite role to play. Uh, who knows? That's... I'm just filling the space here where we would normally talk about the franchise, but I genuinely don't know why there was such a long gap. Right. So because... the hair. From... Yeah. All the accounts, it seems like they would have been greenlit to go for another one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could be like an Indiana Jones situation that they did three movies, they did a trilogy, and then it was like, all right, we're done. You know? Just take a break. Curious, you know, what the precedent or the norm is at this point in time in the 90s to have more than three movies in a series for a mainstream. Yeah, I don't know. Because, yeah, you think about franchises at this time, the only ones that I think got more than three the only ones that come to mind are like the slasher genre the horror genre like you Mm -hmm. had james bond too that's correct uh but yeah most most of them tapped out at three maybe maybe it was just like oh we there the the creative well is dry and we have to move on to different projects i don't know what the thought process is maybe it was just like the standard to like oh we're we're not going to make another one unless we actually have a good idea. Whereas right. today, it's just, if there's money to be made, we're making another one. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's a that's a good point. Who knows? I, I'm not sure. Anyway, next week, we are talking about Live Free or Die Hard. 2007 film directed by Lynn Wiseman. Mm. If you know that name, he also directed Underworld. Hmm. Oh, dang it. You're going to like it. I already lost the bet. <laughs> I lost already. Man. Uh, but before you jump down my throat, yeah. this movie, the, the Live Free or Die Hard, does not seem like it's from the same director. Like, it does not have the same feel at all. Okay. Fair I don't enough. think. I really don't think it does. Fair enough. I'll, I'm going into it open minded. All right. Yeah. Next week, you can look forward to Live Free or Die Hard. I think this will this I'm excited to see what what we think about this one. This mm. is the first this is the jump to the modern day. Like it's a big leap and it's an interesting continuation for this character. Uh yeah. I'm interested to see where we fall on this yeah. one genuinely. So, uh, like out of all of the episodes that we've talked about it sounds weird, but I'm most excited to talk about Live Free or Die Hard. Mm. Cuz I feel like that's Well, there's a big gap. Yeah, it, I feel like that's a, a, a point of contention for a lot of people. Like, there's it has its defenders and it has its detractors. Yeah. Uh, Does he ever get his wife back? Yeah. Like, there's a good day to die hard, which it's pretty much unanimous that people think it's terrible. I haven't seen it. Live for your die hard, though. Hmm, we'll see. Uh, yeah, so this was an honorable death, right? <laughs> no, we save that for the end. Yeah. Yeah. I know. No, there are more movies. <laughs> There are more movies, and I will not deny. Okay, fine. Although my Blu-ray collection for this is just the four and not five. Ha, and I, I beat you. I like that, so I can actually ignore yeah. the existence of five if I end up hating it. Uh, all right. That is the end of our episode. Any closing thoughts? Anything y'all have to say? Uh, I need Die to get some... hard, good. Gru- Die hard, good. Grubaroos. <laughs> <laughs> Great for your diet. <laughs> Yeah, Great. no group That's what I said. Hmm. All right. I said group. Just never mind. Goodbye. Bye. Yippee-ki-yay. Bye. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Are you aiming for these people? No? <laughs> Maybe that one. Maybe that mime. <laughs>